You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Hugh Howie. Happy Friday, everybody. It's episode 233 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. I hope you've enjoyed getting lots of extra podcasts this week. We have uh, put out this the fifth show this week, and the schedule is just as booked for the rest of the month. So I hope you're enjoying this. We have lots and lots and lots of great content coming your way. Today's episode is with the one and only Hugh Howie. He has returned uh, to the U.S., and we're happy to have him on the show. Before we get to that, I would like to tell you about some sponsors. You know that all of this great content that you're getting is uh, brought to you because we have such great sponsors who help offset the cost to bring a show like this to you every day. And uh, if you would like to sponsor the show, go to HankGarner.com. There's a link in that top menu where you can click there and find out uh, how you can sponsor the show. I'd like to thank Daniel Arthur Smith, the curator and publisher of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. The Halloween special is out, and it is phenomenal. This is my favorite monthly publication. I think you're going to love it. Go pick up a copy of Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Also, from my friend Bob Williams comes Music City Macabre and Arch City Apocalypse his post-apocalyptic take on the city of Nashville. He has recently re-released these books. They are phenomenal. New art, new editing. They're tremendous books. He's also combined them into one volume called Blood and Chaos and that gets you Music City Macabre and Arch City Apocalypse together from Bob Williams. There's a link in the show notes. Go pick up these books. Authors, you need to have a website. It's non-negotiable. Now, you have to have a way for people to connect with you. And also readers, if you like to connect with your favorite authors third scribe is the place to do that author websites community to link readers and writers together go visit thirdscribe.com it's newly redesigned and easier than ever to use thirdscribe.com also retrograde from peter codron the international team at the mars endeavor colony is prepared for every eventuality except one What happens when disaster strikes Earth? This book is so much fun. Everybody has been raving about it. You need to go pick up a copy of Retrograde by Peter Codron. Also, this weekend, Peter has a bunch, I think 20 some odd, of his uh, earlier works free to help celebrate his birthday. Happy birthday, Peter. And uh, click on the link in the show notes to go pick up Retrograde and pick up his other books for free. Also, the Paragons Trilogy by C. Stephen Manley. When Dark Portals Open heroes will awaken. If you are looking for some sci-fi mixed with urban fantasy mixed with craziness, go pick up the Paragons Trilogy. Uh, The first book is called Awakened, and I think you're going to love it. See Stephen Manley. This is a name you need to watch for. Also, thanks to my good friends Josh Hayes, Scott Moon, and Ralph Kern at Keystroke Medium. If you're uh, interested in the craft of writing, and I know you are because you're listening to author stories, go give Keystroke Medium uh, a watch over at YouTube. There's a link to it in the show notes. As always, we have an audiobook clip at the end of the show from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series, and Richard and I are recording our annual Halloween special coming up very soon, and I think you're going to love it. Thank you for listening to Author Stories. Subscribe at HankGarner.com. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I'm very excited to have Hugh Howie back on the show. Hugh was with us in episode 51, I believe it was, so uh, almost 200 episodes ago, and uh, lots happened since then. Uh, the last time we talked to Hugh, he was in South Africa and getting ready to uh, to take Wayfinder uh, out for the first time, and uh, so we've got a lot to catch up on, and uh, uh, welcome to the show, Hugh. Welcome back. Oh man, good to be back. Yeah, you just brought back a lot of memories, reminding <laughs> me where I was uh, two years ago. I, I know it was uh, it was crazy. Uh, we our our Skype connection was not great. We we dropped out a little bit, uh, but you know there was uh, uh, there was a a lot going on then. I had just finished reading 
uh, Beacon 23, uh, because you had just finished publishing, uh, you know, all five chapters of Beacon 23. And, and I remember that, uh, reading that book really, uh, had me kind of messed up for a while. And I, I think we talked about it on the show and just, um, you know, the, the unique, uh, position that that, uh, main protagonist was in and really made me think about, uh, kind of our, our typical, uh, reactions to the state of things in the world. And then we were just talking before we started recording. Uh, we're recording this Monday morning and, uh, you know, everybody is, uh, has been, you know, glued to the, to the TV or, you know, to our phones reading the news coming out of Las Vegas this morning. And, uh, you know, before we get started, I, I don't even know how to convey condolences as to what's going on. This is just insane. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, we, we normally start, uh, the show with the, the question of, you know, what's your first memory of, of being a writer? Uh, but, but we've, uh, since you've been on the show before, uh, kind of give us a little update on what's been going on with you for, uh, for this past little bit. Oh, the last two years have been, um, uh, amazing. I mean, two of the best years of my life. I, when I left South Africa to, um, sail around the world, I had, just an idea of what to expect from reading other people's accounts and from my previous sailing adventures. But, um, it, the, the, the journey has been, um, far more than I expected. And, um, it's, uh, um, the last year in particular, I, when I got to New York, it took about a year to sail from, um, South Africa to New York and then back down to Florida. And at that point I'd met, uh, someone who, has become uh, the love of my life and my sailing companion. And we've sailed from New York to New Zealand through the South Pacific and spent um, over a month in Cuba and went to the Panama Canal and spent a month in the Galapagos and went through French Polynesia. And it's just been absolutely insane. I mean, out, out in the middle of the ocean, we were surrounded by a pot of whales at one point, just jumped in the water and swam around with whales and dolphin and, um, it's experiences like that that you uh, know are possible, but you don't think are even probable. And uh, to, to have so many of them on this trip already has just been mind-blowing. Um, but it, it's hard to juxtapose that and like even ha- and have this conversation with the kind of news you woke up to today. And I, I don't know how, like you said, what, what words to use or how to process it. It's just um, it, we become numb to it, you know. It, we're averaging like a mass shooting a day. And... Uh, I don't, you know, people worry about politicizing these things and how to express your grief to the people affected and all those things just feel um, inadequate and um, I don't know, like we need to grieve more and politicize more, I I feel like. It's just, uh, it's uh, draining. It it is, and and as writers... uh you know, when, when the writers are speechless, uh, it's a bad thing. There's, uh, you know, uh, I think that the world looks to, uh, wordsmiths, uh, to find a way to help, to help the collective, uh, grieve and process. And, um, you know, it, it, it comes to a point where everybody's just numb. Yeah. I've got a, a writing friend, um, Dave Cullen, who wrote the, uh, unbelievable book and difficult to read it, uh, not just at times, difficult to read, but I think everyone should read it. Uh, he wrote a book called Columbine that is the definitive account of what happened that day. And every time I know that he's probably going to be busy, he might, might already be on uh, news programs now here in New York because whenever there's these shootings, like they, they go to him to try to help express and understand what's going on. And, yeah, it, it, it helps to have wordsmiths like him help with these things, but knowing Dave and what he goes through every time one of these things happens, like, uh, it's, it's a lot to bear. And I, I don't know how he does it and the people who report on these things do it, but, um, those are some courageous writers to face that, that kind of stuff every day when I get to write just complete nonsense and <laughs> make stuff up. Right. Um, yeah, there's no, no comparison. Well, you know, you say you know, write nonsense and, and make stuff up, uh, but you know, one thing that really resonates uh, with your writing with readers is that you're, uh, 
um, you're not afraid to tackle uh, difficult subjects, maybe controversial subjects, maybe things that uh, that we don't want to think about, uh, you know. But when you couch it in story and uh, make people care about a character, uh, and then walk with them through a situation, it's uh, it's more palatable. It, it we allow ourselves to to think in ways that we wouldn't normally think. Um, so you know, never underestimate the the power of stupid stories to uh, you know to change the way people think. Yeah, I, I I don't give myself enough credit for that, but you know when I'm writing. I, the only way I can get through a, a novel um, is to have uh, some deeper meaning or some point that I want to make. And I try to write in a way that if um, people just enjoy the surface story, they don't have to see any of the, the real stuff that I'm writing about. Um, and that's cool with me. Like, I don't care if anybody catches the, the themes and the symbols and all that stuff. But, um, those kinds of serious issues are what drive uh, the writing process for me. Even my young adult works, maybe especially my young adult works, like the Molly Fied series, um, writing about war and pacifism and um, human nature and evolution uh, and politics. Like that is what um, gets me excited every day to sit down and, and write what appears to be kind of a uh, fantastical, um, like far out there story. It's all grounded in the nonfiction and the the newspapers, the stuff that, that I read uh, in my off time. Uh, that, that's a really uh, fascinating take that uh, that the, the YA stuff is maybe more packed with meaning, uh, if you will. Do you think that that's because uh, that audience is more susceptible or because you as the writer feel like there's more to say to that audience? Do you, is there one or the other? Is it both? Is, or does that even come into the, to the thought process? Yeah, it definitely comes into the thought process. I think younger readers are more uh, open to ideas like that, especially, I don't know, I feel like uh, kids these days are a lot more politically and, and socially aware than my generation was at the same age. Um, and uh, I think if you look at what the Hunger Games series did for a lot of uh, young readers, it's um, the story of revolution and uprising. And um, it's a, basically like a 1984 for a younger audience. And you think that has to have some kind of effect for people that age to encounter the courage um, of their protagonists to stand up to an oppressive government. So I, I think literature can make an impact. It, um, I don't, possibly not my literature, but I know literature in my life has made a huge impact. Reading stories like Ender's Game as a kid and uh, the Foundation series and the science fiction that makes you think that uh, through right action you can lead to a better tomorrow. So, yeah, I, I, think these, I think these issues are important and should be in our fiction, and I do think it have, they have an impact. Yeah. Um. You've got a new book out. Uh, when this airs, uh, it will have been out for a couple of days. And uh, I want to come back to that and this this really uh, awesome collection of stories. But, uh, you know, you had – when you set sail two years ago, when, when you were last on the show, um, you had, uh, as a writer, really taken uh, – and, and whether this was intentional or, or you just kind of got thrust into it uh, – taken a leadership role – uh, in this whole indie revolution, um, you know, you were right on the forefront and, and championing, uh, you know, authors and this this do it yourself attitude and this indie spirit, uh, and you were really kind of writing at the forefront of, uh, of of what was going on there. And then I think a lot of people were really uh, kind of befuddled when you said, "Okay, uh, now that this thing is right." white hot and as you know intense as it can be uh i'm gonna leave the country and go on a boat and uh you know see you guys later <laughs> um I, I, I know i know that this was that had been a lifelong passion of yours and for people that knew you this was not a surprise uh but for people that only knew you as Hugh Howey, the writer guy, and Hugh Howey, the, you know, the indie spirit guy, and, you know, the KDP champion, and, and all of this stuff, um, they were completely, uh, you know, 
taken by surprise. Uh, why was this journey uh, for you so important to embark upon? Uh, well, I, you know, I've been living on boats since uh, I was in college and sailing since I was a little kid. And this has been a dream of mine since high school to sail around the world. Um, and it's, you know, I've had really two life goals. Uh, one was to write a book at some point. One was to sail around the world. And it's uh, been kind of cool that they've overlapped and one has helped allow the other. Uh, and that the sailing allows me to continue writing and the writing has allowed me to sail. So um, I, it, it's amazing to me that, that you can have dreams that seem so um, out of reach and, and be so lucky and fortunate in life to be able to actually do them. Um, but to me, the timing was completely fortuitous because I felt like by the time that I was sailing away that my advocacy was no longer needed. Um, I, I have friends now who email me. Uh, I've just had uh, several conversations this last week with friends who are emailing me and trying to rationalize their decision to publish traditionally. And these are, these are um, big name writers that could do pretty much whatever they want. And they're agonizing over what they feel might be a fatal mistake of going with a major publisher. And I, it's incredible. Seven years ago, I got the exact opposite emails. I got emails from people who were agonizing over the potentially fatal decision to self-publish. And um, if anything, the stigma, at least in the, the circles that I'm in, has completely reversed itself. And now people feel like they have to justify why they're publishing traditionally, uh, knowing that they're going to have a limited time in bookstores and that their earnings are going to be lower and that um, their creativity is going to be stifled and all these other things that come um, with a major publisher. Um, they have to figure out like how they're, they're uh, what pros are going to outweigh those cons. So I, honestly, I think the, the, the war has been won. It's always a war against stigma. It's not a war against earning a living, which is always going to be difficult, or finding readers, which has always been almost impossible. Um, those battles will, will be continue to be fought no matter how you publish. But the war against the stigma, I think, has been um, handily won. And uh, I that was really what, what drove me crazy, watching people make um, maybe not the best decision for their career because one of the decisions carried a lot of baggage and the other didn't. And I think that was always a, a problem for creatives, especially writers. And I, I don't think that issue is there anymore for most writers. I think now they can think about each project and um, what, what the pros and cons are from all the different publishing avenues and what they expect to get out of it and make the proper decision. So, but I think it is, it, it's a great point because there are a lot of people who, um, I mean, my, uh, I was, I'm not known for anything other than being a writer. My friends and family know me as a, a crazy kid who lived on a sailboat and dropped out of college and sailed around the Bahamas for a year and then worked on yachts for 10 years. I was always off on some wild adventure. And, um, uh, those people are like, uh, oh, my God, you finally stopped doing that that wacky writing thing that you got into. Like, to them, that was the crazy part when I was like a domestic guy living in a house with a dog and writing books. They, they couldn't understand that dude at all. Um, but but the, the public who sees me as a writer must think, like, I became completely unhinged and jumped onto a boat and ran around naked. Like, dude, that's, been, that's what I've been doing my whole life. Like, that's who I am. <laughs> Are, are you are you comfortable with the uh, the dichotomy of the of the two parts of you? Uh, you know, as Hugh the writer guy and Hugh the you know run around naked uh, you know on a boat guy. Do, do those things ever find peace with one another? Totally, because the the Hugh writer guy doesn't even exist in my head. Like I I still do not feel like a writer. I don't. Um, it, I, I, I never felt like a writer. I could see my name on a New York Times bestseller list, and it just have you have an out of body experience because that's just not who I am. Uh, I write because I love it; it's like a passion. But uh, to be known for it or to have success with it still just doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, I still feel like I'm living someone else's life. It's just um, uh, too much fantasy, and uh, yeah, yeah, I. That's why I, I, I just ascribe it all to luck. I feel just stupid lucky to have had the career that I've had and 
to be able to write something and put out stories that people are enjoying. I mean, like this new release, Machine Learning, is a good example because I didn't think this book even needed to exist. Um, one of my editors, the great John Joseph Adams, who edits Lightspeed Magazine and has a, an imprint at Houston Mifflin, and, um, he's just one of the great um, the great minds in science fiction today. Like he he knew enough of my short fiction to say like you, know, you deserve to have a collection out there. Like you, readers have would have a hard time finding all this stuff and needs to be in one place. And I thought he was crazy. And it took like going back and reading some of these stories to realize that uh, having enough distance from them to think, damn, some of these are actually kind of good. And now that I've seen the collection and, and heard the reviews from people who have read it, like it's it's humbling to think that. Um, I don't know if people are appreciating these stories that much, but it's a complete disconnect for me and what I think of my contribution to science fiction. I don't feel like I've had any, but uh, I guess I'm just that, I don't know, I'm, I'm the guy on the boat. And the, the writer the writer side of me is like something I'm in complete denial about. Um, you talked a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, your the emails that you get from people and, and trying to justify, uh, you know, one side of the business over another side of the business. Um, in the three years that we've been doing this podcast, uh, you know, I, I have, uh, felt those changes as well. And you get, uh, people from, from big publishers, uh, that at first acknowledged indie publishing. Uh, and then you had, uh, the folks from, uh, big publishing that, you know, spoke favorably about indie publishing. And now you have, uh, the folks that, uh, are realizing that the hybrid author really has, uh, a lot of power in that knowing when to, uh, lean on the big publishers and use the, uh, the machinery that they have in place and knowing when and where, uh, indie authors, uh, have the advantage and, and really exercising the, uh, you know, the power that, that authors have now instead of abdicating that, uh, uh, you know, that power to someone else. Uh, the machine learning is uh, an excellent example of that you, uh, are publishing that digitally, uh, as an indie, aren't you? No, no I, oh. this is a deal. I actually, um, did this deal with, uh, HMH. Okay. And, um, uh, they have the, digital and the print rights for a certain number of years. And it's very similar to a foreign um, book contract, which uh, I, I credit Joe Conrath with uh, putting this bug in my ear years ago. Um, I got on the phone with him before I went to New York to talk about the first offers for my books years ago, back in like 2010. And, um, and, and, and he was describing like what he saw as the future and he, the guy has been right far more than he's been wrong. Uh, but don't, I gotta hope he doesn't hear this or anybody <laughs> tells him that. I don't want, he does not need to know that. Um, but he, he had this vision of like, look, these should be, uh, like they, they should be definitive. Like the, the terms of the contract should be defined in the contract. So five, seven years, just like we do with foreign publishers. And, um, it shouldn't be for the life of the, uh, author plus 20 years the way we have the full term of copyright and uh, he was dead right like those were the those are the fair deals and that's what we've been seeing overseas and that's what I've been getting in the US just by working with fair-minded publishers so um, uh, this book for instance like just wouldn't exist without this publisher because they came to me with the idea of putting it together in the first place a lot of the stories in it are available in other places that are indie published but the packaging and the, um, the, the creativity to even come up with the idea for this and how to, um, uh, how to arrange the stories and, and putting the afterwards in for each story and, and how we're packaging it and releasing it, like that's all of the publisher's creativity, and I had very little to do with that. So, um, yeah, what I, what I love about um, uh, the hybrid model, like you said, is the ability to pick and choose um, when and how to publish and what you expect to get out of each story. This book for me is just a gift to uh, fans and to readers. Um, what money I will make out of it is in the advance and I'll never earn a penny more than that. And I'm totally cool with that. That's not why this book exists. And that's to me the advantage of having a self-publishing career is that I can make 
non-monetary decisions with my other works and go with publishers for other reasons. And some of that is distribution and um, some of that is access to uh, bookstores or other markets. And you have to weigh, you know, every, every project should have its own uh, pro-con list before you make a decision, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think we, we too easily uh, join teams. Uh, you know, I'm either pro-indie or I'm pro-traditional, and I don't want to look at the other side and see that they have any benefit uh, because I'm, you know, team indie or I'm T trad, team trad. And uh, yeah. it, that's, that's it's just not the truth. Uh, the truth is uh, that whatever empowers the author is uh, is what you should do. And, yeah, and I, but, I, but, but that's where the problem starts because people disagree about what empowers the author, and that's where the the tribalism begins. Because people who are team traditional think that what empowers the author is a publisher, and people who are team indie think that what empowers the author is the author. And uh, yeah, so it becomes the disagreements over the details become the the, the boundaries for that tribalism. But I, I, I totally agree with you, and I think. What's helped me is to think about everything from the reader's perspective. So what's what's best for the reader? And like I, I'm a huge proponent for low prices on ebooks. And by low prices, I mean like what a paperback used to cost me as a kid. You know, and I, I know there's inflation. I know a, a hamburger is no longer a, a nickel, but um, pay, mass market paperbacks went from six ninety nine up to about nine ninety nine, and an ebook should not cost uh, more than that. And um, when I started publishing, if I went with a publisher, I, I couldn't negotiate a price at all. Now I have the ability to put price caps in contracts and say, look, we can, we'll do a deal, but you can't charge more than this for the ebook. And before that was an option, like the, the only way to stick up for the reader for me was to self publish. And, and I think if we want to break down these like tribalism, these like worrying about trad versus self, if, we, if everything was about the reader, it, things would be a lot simpler. And we would see that some decisions publishers make are anti-reader, they're terrible, and we shouldn't support them. And some of the things that self-publishing does, if like readers are only going to read in print and self-publishers aren't going to offer a POD version, then they're being anti-reader. And we need to be concerned about that. Sure, sure. Um, when you when you set sail a couple of years ago, um, you know you were at uh, kind of the 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 height uh, the you know, like we said earlier, everything was kind of white hot. You you were publishing, uh, cranking stuff out. Uh, you had a almost constant presence on social media and on your blog, and lots and lots of people came to hear what you had to say about stuff. Um, do you do you feel like um, creatively, and I'm speaking as uh, to you as a writer, not as you uh, the you know, the, the indie spokesman, but you as a writer, um, did getting away and stepping kind of, uh, you know, out of the, uh, the, the spotlight, uh, as being the indie spokesman, uh, did, did that allow your creativity to, to recharge it? Did you, uh, feel like that you had gotten to a, a point that you, you know, really needed to take some time with your writing again. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, did, did getting away and kind of stepping out of all that, did it change you as a writer at all? Uh, it definitely changed me as a writer from the productivity standpoint because I've been having way too much fun. Um, it, it's, it'd be hard to, to, to get up in the morning and like the Turks and Caicos or uh, Brazil and be able to go out in the dinghy and like swim with dolphin and, um, you know, there's a, go hike uh, the rim of a volcano and instead sit and pound out a novel. So productivity has been, has greatly suffered. I think my creativity is maybe about the same. I don't know. I've, I've had some great ideas lately that I think would be uh, just in the last year that I think would make excellent books. I just don't have the time to write them, but I felt like I had that problem before. I've always had more ideas than I've had time to invest in them. But one thing about staying engaged in the community and being engaged with readers is that the pressure to keep producing and um, create sequels and write new stories, um, that pressure is a, is a good kind of pressure. It actually keeps you very productive and um, kept me you know, pretty much holed up in my house in North Carolina and Florida and writing eight to ten hours a day and, and you know, writing two or three novels a year for, for quite a few years. 
um, I could have sustained that for the rest of my life. You know, I know plenty of writers who do that, who um, H.M. Ward and uh, Russell Blake and people who can write um, six to 12 books a, a year and write, uh, keep the quality up while doing it. Yeah, Russell is a um, machine. A, an unbelievable machine. And uh, actually, <laughs> Russell is um, one, of my, one of my favorite machines. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> he, he went he out to and, visit you, didn't he? Yeah, he came and stayed uh, and stayed with us in Cuba, and uh, we had such a good time that I came away just more impressed with that guy than uh, I, I could tell you. I could tell you stories that um, uh, he would he would hire someone to come kill me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he he is he is more fascinating than anybody knows, and uh, um, I I just have so much respect for him and really look up to the guy. But uh, yeah, and. I could have, I could have, you know, um, kept up that that output, but I have this fear of um, putting off the kinds of adventures that I can only do while I'm young, and I have the rest of my life to write. So for right now, um, getting the circumnavigation out of my blood and uh, seeing the world and figuring out um, my our place in it, my place in it, and and what I think about things. I mean, it's it's, it's had such an eye opening effect on me already. And thinking about the United States versus every place that I'm visiting, and look at the differences in our tax systems, and our governments, and our healthcare, and our gun laws, and all these things, um, it's uh, I'm I'm definitely going to be a better writer, and I think a better person after this trip, and that has been worth uh, the adventure in itself. Like, forget the day to day enjoyment of these activities, but immersing myself in these cultures and um, you know, get, being in so many people's homes and different societies, and uh, I, I can't imagine what I what I write after this, but it's going to be completely different. Uh, what uh, What has surprised you uh, about the people that you've met along the way uh, on, on your journey as you got off the beaten path? And, and I know you've been a, a world traveler uh, before, and uh, but. But this is a, it has been a different kind of trip where you're uh, kind of leisurely working your way around and actually taking time to, to, to drop anchor, uh, so to speak, and spend some time, uh, you know, uh, among other people. What, what has surprised you the most about the people you've encountered? I think, um, I don't know if it's a, a too big of a surprise because I, I had a glimmer of this from before, but maybe just the reminder and, and, and the surety, having seen it so many times now, uh, has been a shock. And that's that the things that we blame on American culture and on civilization are actually universal human traits. So we we look at um, you know we we think that people living in primitive cultures live in harmony with nature and they eat healthy and there there's no uh, <laughs> war or strife. Like that's complete complete bunk. And uh, I, I know this from, uh, you know, my nonfiction reading and from study of history and things like that. But going to beautiful islands and just seeing the, the uh, ecological devastation and the littering and the processed foods everywhere and people just grossly overweight and um, people, uh, you know, the, the violence and people not living in harmony with nature at all. Like, I think that would surprise a lot of people to see uh, that these idyllic islands and these amazing people are just as complex and flawed as we are. Uh, they're also just as uh, creative and beautiful and capable of kindness and all the wonderful things as well. But I don't know. We, we tend to idealize um, uh, other cultures and think that if we just got away from our culture, things would be better. The reality is, we need to keep. We need to continue fighting to make the culture that we're in better because it's that's all we've got. Yeah, yeah. People are people, and and we all uh, tend to fall for the same pitfalls and and all of that stuff. No matter where we are, it's really interesting. Totally. Yeah. Um, you uh, you were working on a series of nonfiction books, the Wayfinding series. Uh, when you left, are you still continuing that? Yeah, I've actually I've written three more of those that I haven't published yet, um, and they're uh, pretty much ready to go. The 
one thing that's uh, been really easy to do on the boat is to write. The one that what's been very difficult is to publish because I'm used to doing my own cover art and that requires a fast data connection and grabbing images and, um, you know, uh, being able to move emails back and forth with an editor and upload to KDP and those things. And the, we've been, we've had uh, slow email in most places we've been to, but, um, being cut off from any kind of data connection has been a boon for me, uh, emotionally and spiritually and physically, but publishing wise, it's, uh, it's a necessity. So <laughs> I, I, I've got material that will, um, is ready to go. It's just going to take a while before I get it up there. Yeah. Uh, have you written any more short stories while you've been on the boat? Yeah, I've written, there's a couple new ones in machine learning that I that I wrote, and then I've written a couple for other anthologies. One is um, not out yet. Called it's going to be called Resist, and it's something I'm doing with Gary Weta, and it's a bunch of um, like pro revolution kind of stories, and uh, you know, hopefully to inspire some people with hope and action. Uh, and did one with the X Prize Foundation. Recently, that was kind of cool because I had a contest that um, allowed people to write in and the winner gets like an all expense paid trip to Japan and just announced the winner for that last week. Um, So I've I've stayed I've stayed involved and active, but it's been through um, getting to islands with some Wi-Fi to submit stuff and um, keep catch up with emails. Yeah, it's been uh, it's still been a very active year for me, just probably less noticeable because it's not a lot of big novel new releases. Right. Right. The new book is uh machine learning. It's a collection of short stories. You mentioned that, that John Joseph Adams uh, approached you about uh, collecting and, and publishing. Um, you are, are, are quite known for your uh, prolific uh, short story writing. And some of those stories have then uh, gone on to, to be, uh, novels, uh, most famously, uh, Wool, and, uh, you know, I think you, you published Sand also, it kind of, uh, in, in installments, uh, like that. What is it about the short story that intrigues you? Um, I, that's a good question. Um, I, f- I feel like it's just where I'm most comfortable writing. Uh, maybe, you know, I grew up reading a lot of comic books, and I think, uh, these days, the, the medium that I get the most entertainment out of uh, might be television, really well done television. And there's something about episodic content that gives you um, more uh, climaxes and more um, like resolutions and didactic experiences within the story. So, you know, with a good comic book series, you have this overall, this overarching um, plot. And within that, you have lots of smaller plots. And um, I don't know that appeals to my attention span and my desire to see a lot of different um, uh, conflicts and resolutions. I think the middle part of most novels are very difficult to keep me uh, engaged. That's it feels like uh, a lot of times it feels like padded filler in order to satisfy the the printing demands. You know that the, the hundred thousand word novel, which is also insane. Like novels were fifty thousand words for many years. Um, a lot of the a lot of the great classics, when you see them on the shelf, you're like, oh, they look so skinny, and that's because that's what a, a novel was. And I think for pricing reasons, we've we've padded those out. And I I found with a good short story, you can get just as much excitement and just as much character development, and present a really interesting idea. And in in some ways, by not um, inundating the reader with the idea, they're left to think about it and dwell on it for a lot longer than a thick novel would. You know. Um that's exactly my experience as well. That the last thing you said, uh, I, I love a short story that, um, when I'm, when I finish it, I, it's, it's still living in my head. Uh, like I, I love that, uh, a lo- if a short story is done really well, um, the author doesn't have to tie everything up precisely at the end. Uh, you can leave it for me to kind of stew on a little bit and kind of wonder what happened. Maybe there's some resolution, but there's not an ultimate resolution. Um, I, I love that part of short stories. And uh, I think when done well, they really uh, engage the reader more than a, than a long novel. I totally agree. Yeah. And 
almost by leaving something slightly unfinished, yeah. then you're you're left to process it uh, as the reader. So um, that's been my experience uh, as a reader, and um, also there's a, I think there's a bit of I have so many story ideas that if I if I treated them all like novels, I wouldn't get to a fraction of them. And this way, I can uh, play with a lot more of them. And the ones that really resonate with myself and with readers are things that I can expand upon and and flesh out more. Uh, do you approach them differently, uh, a short story from a novel? Or in the beginning, do you even know which one is which? Uh, yeah, I usually, I usually set out knowing about how long I want the piece to be. I think the good thing about a short story is I can hold the whole thing in my mind before I start writing and I can see it from all angles. And so I can sit down and write a lot freer and, um, it almost feels like I'm writing by the seat of my pants, even though I know the whole story, I just feel looser, more relaxed. And with a novel, when I set out to write it, um, it's almost like I'm holding the reins a little tighter. Uh, don't want it to get away from me. Don't want it to jump the rails. And you know, I've, I've got somewhere I got to, B, but it's a long trek, so we got to stick to the plan. And so uh, I don't know, it might just be psychological, but when I write a short story, I feel um, completely unbridled. And even though I know exactly the story that I want to write, um, I, I, it's like I'm a little more loosey goosey and uh, in the flow. And I think there's similarities with sports. Um, sometimes when you don't have any pressure on you, you can just, the, the hoop feels you know, twice as wide and the, every ball you put up, you know, it's going to be nothing but net. And when I'm writing short stories, that's how I feel. When I'm writing novels, it's like I'm um, in a marathon and I'm like, you know, just grit through the pain and I'll get through this. and I know I'll be happy at the end. Is your process different writing short versus long? Um, do you, uh, do you outline more or less for one or the other or, um, does it feel different as far as the craft to you? Yeah, with I don't outline on paper very much. Uh, with my novels, I make notes and I'll make a, um, for me, the outline is like writing kind of synopses and writing little character treatments. But I, I do most of my outlining just by daydreaming about the story over and over again until I know it by heart. And then, and then I'm just sitting down and relating a story that I've seen a hundred times in my in my mind to someone who, who maybe can't see or is uh, in a dark room. I want them to, to see the story as well as I have. With a short story, um, I can do that without writing a single thing down. I can just keep thinking about the story and then I can sit down with a blank page and write the whole story out. With a novel, I know I won't be able to hold all this information, so I'll have an open document that I'll make little notes and jot things down. And, but that's about the, the only difference in the technical aspect of how I'll do it. Gotcha. Um, machine learning is a collection of, uh, stories. Some of them were previously published. Some of them you self published. What else is in the book? Uh, maybe, uh, you know, you've got some listeners that like me and, and have read, uh, I think all of your, your short stories that you've you know published on KDP. What else is in the book? Well, some stories in there, um, haven't been on KDP or have are inside of anthologies that readers may not have, um, uh, read or, or bought or even know exist. So I, I think people would be surprised when they see the, the diversity of the stories in there. And of course, a couple are new to the anthology. Um, there are n notes after each story that I wanted to make as um, intimate as possible. I, I don't want to um, try to hold anything back. So whatever that story meant to me, I really tried to put that in the uh, afterward of each story, even if it meant exposing some some doubts or some vulnerabilities that are that are difficult to admit, um, I uh, I think people are are appreciative of that, and the feedback that I've gotten on these afterwards has been really um, amazing. Like really, it uh, validates the decision to have them there and, and the the content that we put into them. And, um, there's a, a great forward by Jamie Ford, um, <laughs> a writer far too talented to be <laughs> involved in any of my projects. And, uh, for an afterward, uh, and an, an acknowledgments, I, I chose to, to thank a lot of the editors that I've uh, worked with over the years that have furthered my career. So it's very autobiographical, this, 
um, collection. It's a, basically a, covers a span of time that um, goes from before I uh, to stuff I was writing while sailing through Panama and the Pacific. And it covers um, pretty much the full breadth of my personality and my neuroses and hopes and fears and dreams. And I'm as proud of this work as I've been of any novel I've ever published. You know, as writers, there's there's always a little piece of us in in our stories uh, that we publish, and there's always uh, if if someone is uh, you know watches closely enough, they can pick out the little pieces that are that are our our fears and foibles and and all of that stuff. But when you actually um, write, you know, personally from the first person and in these, uh, afterwards, uh, that's a whole other thing. Um, were you scared at all about, uh, kind of peeling back the layers and laying yourself bare, uh, in these, uh, afterwards? Uh, not scared. There's a part of me that worry that worried whether or not it was the right thing to do. Uh, then that was quickly dispelled, but, um, you know, what's been really useful about, um, about the sailing trip. And I've done a lot of sailing over the years and um, many miles and lived on boats for a long time and uh, done some long passages, but it was all up and down the East coast. And I've never, I never crossed an ocean. Um, last time I was on the show, uh, I'd still never crossed an ocean um, and sailing across the Atlantic and the Pacific um, has such a calming effect. I mean, the, the things that you think are challenging um, really become pretty menial when you've overcome just the, the logistical complexities with sailing across an ocean just on the wind alone. Um, and it uh, puts things in into perspective. And um, I think being vulnerable to readers is uh, not any harder than being vulnerable to Mother Nature. And uh, uh, you feel so small out there that any kind of ego that would prevent you from taking risks, personal risks, is uh, pretty soon washed away. You, all the sailors that we meet, um, Shell and I, as we're sailing around the world and meeting people everywhere who are doing this, are just the most down-to-earth and calm uh, and collected, rational people you'll ever meet. Um, because everyone who's not has been pretty, pretty much given up on this process or it's been wicked out of them. I mean, the, the sail that we had from Tonga to New Zealand, which is a notoriously difficult sail, um, was, was brutal. And, um, like just watching Michelle, um, conquer, the, uh, the task needed to get through that sail, just see how uh, it changes you and how this, uh, um, uh, this, this journey affects you. And it makes decisions like whether or not to reveal something in a, in a book, (laughs) you you laugh about it. And you saw that today with like, with today's tragic events, like the things that, um, people are upset about, like whether or not someone is kneeling for a national anthem, like, like that was the thing that we were angry about yesterday, but today you have, you should have a different perspective on life. Um, and unfortunately it's, it's elastic. The challenge is to maintain these perspectives and to maintain, um, healthy and, productive ones and sailing has done that for me. Writing has done that for me. Um, this collection is, uh, come at the nexus of those two careers and that, that's, that makes it exciting as well. Uh, Hugh, you guys are in the States for, uh, for about a month. I think, uh, what's, uh, what do you, where do you go from here? Um, I'm in, uh, New York right now got Comic Con coming up and the book release tomorrow. Um, as we record this, uh, two days ago, probably as you're listening to it, and um, lots of family um, visiting and lots of book signings and stuff like that. And then from here we go out west for a few events in um, Seattle and uh, San Francisco. And then I go to Poland for the Conrad Literary Festival in um, Krakow. And from there, back to New Zealand to rejoin the boat. About the first week of November, I'll be back on Wayfinder. So, yeah, just a, just about a month of kind of a bit of a whirlwind here. And um, a lot of us to see friends and family and 
uh, coincided with some book stuff, so we're t- taking advantage of that. Um, but uh, just a f- pretty small stopover, really. When you get back to New Zealand and to Wayfinder, uh, where does the uh, the journey take you from there? We ha- we really need to stay down there for the cyclone season, so we'll sail around New Zealand. We're going to go down to the South Island and, and rent a van and just backpack and do some adventure stuff in the South Island, hiking and and see that. And then um, we'll sail around the North Island until about April or May and then head to Fiji. And uh, from Fiji, maybe Vanuatu and Indonesia. And then we'll decide if we want to um, uh, continue straight across or if we want to come back down for another season in New Zealand or Australia, which some people do. But you know, it's all up in the air. It's very flexible. Some of it depends on uh, if things develop with a couple of TV and movie projects that are underway. Um, there's also the possibility of hauling the boat out for the North Hemisphere summer and spending that in New York and uh, resuming after that. Um, you know, we we both work from the boat, so we're able to pick and choose and. Um, can don't don't have to have really hard. I, I'm actually terrified of completing this trip too quickly. <laughs> um, and and if we kept sailing in another year and a half, I'd be in South Africa, and we would sail across to the Caribbean again, and and be back on the East Coast. And to me, right now, we have a a home on the other side of the planet, and I'd like to keep it there for a bit. Yeah. Uh, when when the journey finally. Uh, comes to an end and, and we're not rushing it, but when it finally comes to an end, um, do, you know, is, is that chapter over? Do you, do you have plans after that? Yeah, we have all kinds of dreams that we talk about. I still want to open a bookstore and, um, maybe, maybe here in New York somewhere, open up a bookstore that, um, you know, might lose money and might be like where I, um, uh, put back every penny that, publishing is provided to me and just put it back into the community, but I'll be cool with that. I would just go to the bookstore every day and, um, we, you know, tackle running it as a business, but also use it as a place for writers and readers to congregate. And, um, that's certainly one dream right now. It's not a dream that'll, that'll probably ever go away. Um, and, uh, well, I'm sure boating will always be a part of my life, whether we keep Wayfinder and do something seasonally, between the Caribbean and New England or um, move to a smaller boat for something like that. I uh, really don't know, but living in New York is definitely uh, in the, in the works. That's something that I want to um, spend some time in my favorite city and write many novels here and be a part of the reading and writing community here. And um, how we'll balance that and boating will, remains to be determined, but, that's the dream right now, but that's probably my guess is that's that that life is three or four years off. Gotcha. Uh, since you mentioned it, I'll ask you one last question. And uh, is there any news you can share with us about uh, the TV and movie stuff that's going on? Um, not not that I can share. We everything that we can share, I share is like the the microsecond they give me permission to share it. Um, the Sci-Fi Network picked up Sand, and that was uh, announced during uh, San Diego Comic Con just a few weeks ago. Um, and it, the, the amount of steps it takes to get uh, something on the air makes me respect everything I've ever seen on television. Even if it's a terrible movie or a terrible TV show, I just like applaud everyone involved for actually getting something made. Um, and uh, it's also exciting to see, like uh, my friend uh, Neil Stevenson just got. Um, Snow Crash picked up by Amazon. No, that's crazy. You know, which is ah, so amazing. And when you think, you know, like Neil Stevenson has written some of my favorite works of science fiction, and none of them have gotten the media treatment that they've deserved. And thank goodness, because yeah. we only we only have the ability to do them justice now. Um, well, yeah, when, when you finish I, you reading know, I, a Neil Stevenson book, you have a headache. Imagine what someone you know who's tasked with translating that to to the screen yeah right yeah. you got 120 minutes man i can't i can't wait to see snow crash on tv and i hope like kryptonomicon and so many of his other works uh diamond age would be the absolute oh, best yeah. if they can make uh, hopefully snow crash does well enough that diamond age becomes the next thing but the, the lesson here is that these are books are 
you know, 20 years old and they're um, just now getting the treatment they deserve. So I feel absolutely no rush. Like uh, the, the opportunities that I've had to work with some of the creatives who've done adaptations, uh, seen three different scripts for wool and they're all brilliant. I could, I could do that for another 10 years before someone makes like a, some web movie for, you know, animated adaptation of wool. And I'm excited about that. Um, so I, I don't know. I, my family and readers are always asking me like, when's something going to happen? When's something going to happen? And I tell them never, it's never going to happen. <laughs> just, just in, you just have to enjoy the ride and be so grateful that the, the book is there and that there are people interested and that there's people working on stuff. Um, so I, I, I'm just enjoying the process and I'm not going to believe anything until I see it on the screen for myself. It's probably a, a pretty healthy attitude to have about it. And, and then when something does happen, it's just, you know, it's a gift and it treated as such. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Hugh, I've had a great time talking to you. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. Um, you know, I think we've all enjoyed watching, uh, your, your travels on, on Facebook and, and YouTube and everything. And, and hopefully people are not living vicariously through your journey, but, but are inspired to take their own. Uh, in, instead when they see what's going on with you. Um, uh, congratulations on machine learning. We're going to send everybody to go pick it up. And uh, thanks for taking time to come on. Thanks, Hank. Thanks for having me back, man. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Tune in for new episodes every Tuesday and Friday. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. They reverently slipped Jason's giant size X-Men number one from its Mylar protector. Drinking in the sweet aroma of browning paper and three-color process that signals only the best and rarest and most wonderful of collectibles. On one page, Professor X raised his fingers to his temples and rallied his X-Men his psychic commands radiating from his bald head like waves off hot asphalt. I have psychic powers, Owen blurted. I want Wolverine's claws, Jason was turning a page. Snick! Or, hey, get this, get this, lightsabers poking out the backs of my hands, or even, no, no, I'm totally serious. I have psychic powers. No, you don't. I do. Jason laid the comic on the bedspread. He sighed. Owen could be such a spaz sometimes. Okay, he said indulgently. What number am I thinking of? Stop, it doesn't work that way. What I can do is called a psychic reading, off an object, like getting impressions. When the doorbell rings, if I put my hand on the knob, as soon as I do, I know who's there. It's called looking through the peephole, moron. Shut up! And when I touch the phone, I know who's calling. I'm sure, Mr. Bullshit from Bullshit Mountain. Like my sister or my grandmother, I just know it's them. There's no such thing as psychics. Okay, you try. Don't be stupid. Are you chicken? Fine! Okay. He snatched up a brown paper bag, spotted with grease, and dumped a few stale french fries into the trash can. I'll put an object in this bag, and you try to guess what it is. Turn your back. Jason did and heard a rustling behind his head. Okay, you can look now. Owen produced the bag. It was rounded with some object now. Don't touch yet, just think. Try to imagine what's inside. Your lunch? Jason sneered, but he closed his eyes and tried to imagine. He could hear Owen's breathing. Jason's nose itched. His brain grew bored with nothing to look at, and fragments of images swam in and out of his imagination. Strawberry, he blurted. Owen reached into the bag, producing a white bowl. Jason had eaten frosted flakes from it about three days ago. A few stuck to it, like little beige fish scales. See? I lose. No, look here. Owen pointed. A design went around the sides of the bowl. A long string of vines and painted fruit. With strawberries. That's... Jason began, but didn't know how to end the sentence. It's cool. See? What did I tell you? Do it again. Jason closed his eyes. An image like daisies and sun and 
yellow, he blurted after three seconds. Oh my God, open your eyes. Owen held a bright yellow highlighter pen. I hadn't even put it in the bag. And so they went, for thirty minutes or more. A staple remover, a toy soldier, a sweat sock, a pencil. Jason never said precisely what was in the bag, but it was always close or related. He'd imagine a cockpit, and Owen would produce a game controller. He'd say plate, and the object would be a CD. He made right angles with his pointer fingers, shrugging, only to have Owen pull out Eliza's knitting needles. His friend became more and more enthusiastic, but Jason became a little scared. You have a real gift, Owen said. You're, like, brilliant. Owen babbled for a long time about astral projection and ESP, how Jason was picking up signals from Owen's own psychic powers, which had obviously been doing the broadcasting. Owen left that night full of plans and experiments, vindicated in his beliefs. Jason sat on the bed after Owen left, thinking hard. He had no explanation for what he'd done, but he knew he hadn't faked it. He couldn't believe, but he couldn't deny, either.